I'm Marnie Hughes, and this is Missing on News Nation. Each week, we focus on a missing person case from across the country. We take you behind the headlines because every missing person matters to us, no matter their background or their past or their race, their circumstances. They are missed by their family, their friends, their community, and sometimes by complete strangers. It is our mission to bring these cases into the national spotlight with the hope of finding answers and sometimes finding closure, whatever that looks like. And we think that you can help us solve some of these mysteries by watching, by sharing. This week, we are revisiting a case from the quaint college town of Bloomington, Indiana. It has been more than a dozen years since a 20-year-old college student named Lauren Spearer vanished after a night of partying with her friends. Still, police say the case is active today and the family's private investigator is calling on the people who were with Lauren all those years ago to speak up. We just wanna thank all of our friends and family. I can hear her voice. And she's just such a loving girl. It's been more than a dozen years since Charlene Spearer heard her daughter Lauren's voice. You almost don't want to remember the good things because it's paralyzing. So paralyzing that Lauren's parents have stopped doing interviews. Instead, we spoke to their private investigator, Mike Siravolo. There we go. That's much better. The former NYPD detective led the Zodiac Killer Task Force in the 90s and is the senior investigator at his firm, Bodiedel and Associates. And I saw it on every news channel, uh, every cable news, network news. Uh, it was all over uh, the internet. The disappearance of IU student Lauren Spear. The family of Lauren Spear. Lauren Spear. Lauren Spear. Lauren Spear disappeared after a long night out with friends on June 3rd, 2011. I mean, my first thought was it could be any of my friends. That night, Lauren texts her boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, that she plans to go to bed, but she doesn't. Lauren then goes out to Kilroy's sports bar with friends using a fake ID. Witnesses say Lauren left visibly intoxicated and forgot her shoes and phone. With her is Corey Rossman. He's seen on unreleased surveillance video walking with Lauren back to her apartment building. When they got to the building, Corey is confronted by some other boys who know Lauren. They saw she wasn't in the best shape to travel, and they were trying to do the right thing. They suggested to Corey, hey, you know, she's in bad shape. Why don't you just make sure she gets back to her room down the hall? Corey resists them, and one of the boys hits Corey in the face. They return to Corey's apartment. His roommate tells police Corey and Lauren were both drunk, and a neighbor tries to convince Lauren to stay, but she ultimately leaves their apartment barefoot with no phone. And that's the last time Lauren Spearer was ever seen. The next day, Lauren's boyfriend reports her missing when no one can get in touch with her. But after that, Siravolo says Jesse and the boys Lauren was with that night have been uncooperative. After Jesse reported her missing later that afternoon, Jesse was like, she's dead. I know she's dead. Well, how do you know she's dead? So that's Jesse Wolf. Multiple news reports show Jesse helped look for Lauren in the initial days of her disappearance, but then quickly left town. He also passed a privately administered lie detector test and declined one from police. Siravolo says he's talked to all the boys who were with Lauren that night, except for Corey Rossman. He called the police on Siravolo and his team when they went to question him at his apartment. Corey Rossman has not been cooperative with us from day one. He wasn't cooperative with News Nation either. After multiple attempts to reach him and the other boys, our messages weren't returned. The only response came from Mike Beth. Via phone, he told us he had nothing to add. Siravolo was critical of the initial police investigation, and so was the community. In a report from our News Nation station in Indianapolis, some neighbors say they hadn't seen police or been questioned by them for 10 days, even though police records indicate they spoke to nearby residents the day after Lauren's disappearance. Has anybody ever come to ask you, hey guys, did you guys notice anything weird on the morning of June 3rd? Uh, not, not, uh, not recently. They just started walking around right now, coming up and down the street, but... They haven't to the date. 
Do you think it's weird that the cops haven't asked you in 10 days if you've seen anything? I think it is just because we live so close to where she went missing. I think it's a little late. I feel like it, they were going to do that. They would have done it, you know, the day after, two days after. We asked for an interview. Bloomington police say it's been their policy not to do interviews. In a statement, they said the investigation remains very active. And over the last three to four years, investigators have received over 800 tips and executed at least 10 search warrants. As for Siravolo, he believes there are three things that could have happened to Lauren. An opportunist took her. Her boyfriend did something out of jealousy or... Lauren, who had a, a bad heart and may have been overserved that night, could have passed, you know, her heart could have given out while she was in their apartment in Rosenbaum's apartment uh, and that they concealed uh, her body. Lauren had a heart condition called long QT syndrome. She was also just four foot 11, weighing 95 pounds. It leads one to believe that perhaps they acted in concert uh, in some way, shape or form and uh, perpetrated a criminal act. However, the boys and their parents have maintained they did nothing wrong and are cooperating with police. Lauren's parents have repeatedly called for anyone who knows anything to come forward. At this year's anniversary of her disappearance, her mom posted a statement saying, 12 years you have kept your secret. 12 years we have continued our search. I write today as a reminder that we will never stop. Because someone may see something, see, see this interview and, and pick up a phone and they have real solid information or maybe have a, finally have a, a conscience and, and come forward with that information. When you're a detective, you can't have any preconceived notion. You have to let the chips fall where they may and the, the, the facts lead you. Still a mystery, and this is where you come in. Take part in the discussion. You can leave your comments as we continue to cover Lauren's case. And if you have questions, I encourage you to ask them. Joining me now, News Nation Law and Justice contributor Jennifer Koffendoffer. Jennifer, this case is such a mystery, and I am so saddened for Lauren's family 12 years later, and we're seemingly nowhere closer to knowing exactly what happened to this college student. The opportunist theory from the PI that he threw out a moment ago, you agree that that may be the most likely scenario here. Why do you think so, based on what evidence we have? Yes, it really resonates with me, Marnie, and this is why. Uh, I really don't believe this was a conspiracy with her boyfriend and her other friends that she was out that night with. There were just too many cameras in and around there. It would be so difficult to, uh, remove her if she did indeed have some sort of overdose or some sort of heart situation that occurred and get her out of that without anyone knowing or anyone seeing anything. And you know what they say about a secret amongst three people. It's only kept a secret if two aren't around. So I really don't think that's the answer. This was 4.30 in the morning, as you know, Marnie, and this is a time where there's light street traffic, there's light uh, traffic in terms of foot traffic, I just want to see those cameras, the camera footage of what was happening in and around that area at that time. Right. And we have asked for the camera footage, the surveillance video from early that morning when Lauren was last seen, yet police are not releasing it. What would be the reason behind keeping that uh, under wraps at this point all these years later? Marnie, I can't see a good reason whatsoever. I mean, this is a case where definitely individuals need to know about the details, know about where she was exactly in Bloomington. You never know who might have seen something or recall something. They were on their way to work. You know, they worked at a bakery, something at, that they might have seen at 4.30 in the morning. But because they don't know about this case even now, it doesn't mean anything to them. It's important to get it out there. Right, and it's important to the family to ask the question, why weren't more people questioned in and around the time that Lauren disappeared? You heard the people who lived in that neighborhood said, nobody came and talked to me. Uh, you hate to armchair quarterback police in these investigations, but it seems like that would have just been part of the, the process and the necessary tasks in the next 24, 48 hours after she disappeared. Talk to people in the community. 
Well, I think the biggest problem they had is they're a very small police force. And, and remember, of course, they're still dealing with all the other issues that would have come up that day. So it was so important for them to get the Indiana State Police involved, to get federal authorities involved very early on because they bring boots on the ground. They bring that experience of working missing cases and the numbers would have increased in terms of law enforcement that would have been able to go out and conduct those interviews. And after all these years, Bloomington police say we're still on this case. We're actively investigating. We're getting hundreds, thousands of tips, even now where tips are still coming in. They describe some as actionable. What does that mean to you? When I hear a tip is actionable, it means that there's actual substance to it that you can follow up on. They've given a particular time, a particular date they saw something, and a particular person or area that needs to be searched. That's actionable. Inactionable are sort of a nebulous uh, tip, which comes in something like, I had a dream and I saw her by a pond. Something like that is totally inactionable. I have a couple questions from our viewers for you, Jennifer, and um, do your best to answer them. From Angela in Bloomington, in Indiana, where this case uh, centers, she asks, have the police used sonar scanning on any buildings or basements near her apartment or near sh where she would have been missing, um, either then or now? How might that technology assist in this type of investigation? Well, we don't know that they've used any sort of technology in this case. Uh, I've been asking about the digital forensics on all the phones of the individuals that were in and around her at this time. Also possible geofencing that could have kept track of who might have been on their phone in the area at this time. Again, this is 4.30 in the morning, so you would expect there to be very few people in and around these streets. But back to the question, I think it could possibly be useful, but I think that mainly what happened here is she was removed from Bloomington, and that's why she hasn't been found yet. Yeah, I have a comment. This is from Tammy Bowers, also from Indiana, said this is a very sad disappearance of a beautiful young lady and daughter. Someone needs to speak up. Someone knows something. Man up and do what's right. Please, her parents need closure. And as a parent myself who has buried my youngest son due to suicide, uh, you don't want anyone to lose anyone. She sends her prayers. When someone goes missing, everybody who cares about that person shows up. So what does it tell you that some of those closest to her left town, nobody has been arrested, named a person of interest in this case, but some of her friends also did not participate in polygraph tests with police? I think it's concerning, Marnie. That certainly does jump out, particularly since her boyfriend and her were associated and had a long relationship. So it doesn't make a lot of sense that he didn't want to take a polygraph, that he was only there searching for two days. But recall, the parents are going to have some interaction with that. They're probably going to realize that one of the first per people that uh, individual law enforcement is going to focus on is on the significant other. So perhaps in a protective mood, uh, their parents just wanted him removed from that situation and under their umbrella of, of you know, not being able to be talked to by uh, the public and by police. Yeah, and that's certainly understandable. When this was happening, it was national news and it was scary for all involved, not to mention the other kids on that university campus. Uh, Janet from Lafayette, Indiana asks, is there any evidence that her abduction was human trafficking? Looking into that then and now would still be part of the open investigation. Right, but it's just, so if you were a person that was going to human traffic, would you sit out at 4.30 in the morning looking for a target? You might sit out at, at 12 midnight or two o'clock when the bars close, but this would be just a very hard time uh, to find somebody that would be a target for you. That's why I really think it was a moment of opportunity. Here she was, slight of build, you know, 95 pounds, four foot tall, obviously very inebriated, no purse, no cell phone, no shoes, uh, wandering uh, in this area. And I think somebody took the opportunity maybe just to uh, have some sort of, uh, you know, illicit contact with her and that went south perhaps. And then he took her to another location and that's why she hasn't been found. It's a cautionary tale, Jennifer. Lauren's mom uh, wrote in a social media post, her name is Charlene, that I think most college students believe that they're invincible. I think Lauren trusted that she was safe, wrong place, wrong time, wrong people. She wasn't careful and she wasn't safe. 
What is your message to college students, young men and women, as they embark on this exciting journey of life and, and to be vigilant and careful about their surroundings? Well, it is such a great time and a great opportunity, but unfortunately in the day and age we live, you just have to be uh, definitely with people you know, uh, not be by yourself if you're going to be drinking and be inebriated. As a woman, you're very vulnerable if you're by yourself even jogging. So it's important to have your uh, pepper spray with you and on the ready uh, and to really be alert, not have those ear pods in, not be looking down at your phone, uh, but be aware of your surroundings so you can detect any type of danger that could approach you. Finally, Jennifer, so many families in the missing cases that we cover turn to private investigators because they hit dead ends and they run out of evidence and the clues just start to dry up. What is the role of a private investigator and how can they be helpful for families like Lauren's in cases such as this? Well, private investigators serve, I think, a very important role in these types of cases because at some point the local authority just doesn't have those resources to really concentrate on that missing person case. So the private investigator can go in and pick up sort of where police left off and they can also bring a fresh set of eyes, Marnie, to these cases and maybe see something that uh, the inv investigators missed. So I think they're very important and play a crucial role in helping to find the missing. And do police uh, welcome that assistance and help if PIs come up with something that may have um, been overlooked? I think good investigators do. Good investigators will uh, you know, be understanding of that situation, but oftentimes they also feel encroached upon or that they haven't done a good job and somebody's looking over their shoulder and, and you know, Monday morning quarterbacking them. So I have found that particularly in these types of situations in small towns, uh, they are not necessarily very helpful to private investigators. Well, I hope as the PI in this case said, somebody who knows something comes forward and we get this case solved uh, for Lauren's family and friends and all involved. Jennifer, thank you for taking a look at it with us as always. Thank you so much, Marnie. And if you have any information on Lauren Spears' disappearance, again, she went missing in 2011, just 20 years old at the time. She's four foot 11, just 95 pounds. You can contact the Bloomington Police Department. And if there's a missing person case you think that we should know about, you can send it to us at newsnationnow.com slash missing. You can send us tips on cases we've already covered as well. We welcome you to do that. I'm Marnie Hughes in Chicago, back next week with another missing case.